Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast. I'm your host, Byron Pace. It is the 2nd of April, 2020, and boy, oh boy, do I have a great show for you today. But first, before that, a massive thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys have been freaking awesome in the last two weeks. You really have been. And because of you and because of the support you've shown us, I am now able to bring you an extra podcast. We released the first one a week ago, Into the Wilderness Shorts. I interviewed Dr. Jason Goldman, and we discussed the complications of re-establishing a previously extirpated population of sea otters to the archipelago of Hadaguay. These podcasts are going to come out in the in-between weeks, so we're going to carry on with these long-form conversations that we've always had, but instead of having to wait two weeks for another podcast to come out, one week later we're going to have these short-form conversations, which are going to be about 15 minutes, very specific, hopefully quite concise, and it's going to allow us to tackle a whole variety of topics from around the world focused on the science of conservation. So let us know what you thought about the podcast last week. And we've got another one coming out for you in a week's time. Of course, I have to shout out our top tier Patreon supporters, which this week include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Chris Griffith, John Henry Pete, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, the guys at South Ash Stalking, Josh Starling, and Sean Rowan. Sean being our latest top tier. So welcome, Sean. On today's show, I chat with Levison Wood, a previous podcast guest. If you want to check out the last conversation we had with him, look out episode 116. It'll give you way more background on Levison because we don't really dig into that at all on this podcast. We really focus about his new book called The Last Giants and his upcoming series on Channel 4, which is based on the book called Walking with Elephants. So most of our conversation is around that, although we do start talking about isolation in London due to, of course, the coronavirus pandemic. He is one of the great modern day explorers. He's done some incredible adventures around the world. And we really dig into so much of that in the previous podcast with him. So I encourage you, if you find this fascinating, go back and check out podcast 116 if you haven't listened to it already. This conversation really digs into the issues of elephants in Africa. We talk about evolution, the problems with corruption, terrorism, poaching, and the fragility of tourism funding in conservation, which has really been brought to light from the current issues that we are seeing around the world right now, with us all having to sit at home in isolation, and all of this money from tourism just drying up around the world. There's a lot to learn from this episode and some great takeaways. So even if you don't find yourself particularly intrigued by the continent of Africa and elephants, and I don't know how you possibly couldn't, I promise you're going to learn something from this conversation. And to give you an idea of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks, because for the first time I've actually got a lot of podcasts in the bank I'm still working on a show about lead toxicity and the phasing out of lead ammunition in the UK. It's been a complicated show that I've pulled in four or five interviews. I've got one left to do, which is with a vet who's going to bring the real nitty gritty of the science to the conversation. So I hope to have that one out in two weeks. I also hope to put a podcast out fairly soon on the trophy hunting ban in the UK. I've still got one or two interviews to pull in on from that. I had a great conversation with Merlin Becker, who was previously from the GWCT, about their model farm in the Highlands. So that's ready to go. Just a few days ago, I had one of my favorite conversations in a long time with Ryan Youngblood, who's an incredible cinematographer uh, based in Texas. Uh, I'm not quite sure when that one's going to go out, but you do not want to miss that conversation. And then for our short shows, the Into the Wilderness Shorts, I've just recorded uh, a conversation with a scientist from Harvard University about the toxicity of mercury within our oceans and what's happening there. And in a couple of days' time, I'm going to do an interview with a researcher in Germany talking about the potential implications and consequences of COVID-19 
in primates, and specifically endangered gorilla populations. So a lot to look forward to there. As always, in conjunction with our show partners, Modern Huntsman, we have a winner from the competition two weeks ago. All we asked you to do was share this podcast with a friend. So I looked across social media for all the people who had tagged us in posts and randomly picked Sean Rowan389. That's the Instagram name, Sean Rowan389. Congratulations, Sean. Contact us either through Instagram or email podcast at paceproductionsuk.com and we will get you your choice of Modern Huntsman, whichever volume you want, uh, out as a thank you for sharing the podcast. And I have another competition for you this week, again, to win a volume of Modern Huntsman. And because we're doing a reprint of one and two and three and four are currently available on the shop, thepacebrothers.com, you can pick what copy you win. So to be in with a chance this week, it's very, very simple. Just go and review this podcast on whatever platform you listen to us on. And all of the new reviews from this show to the show that's out in two weeks' time will go into a random number generator and we will pick the winner. So get reviewing and good luck. And the very last thing before we jump into the show, the Northern Shooting Show, which is at the Yorkshire Showground, previously had dates in May, but because of uh, the lockdown that we are currently facing in the UK and much of the world, those dates have changed. They are now the 28th and 29th of August, 2020. So same year, but just in August. I look forward to seeing you all there. And I think that's it. No more further delay. Let's jump into this fascinating conversation with Levison Wood. Levison, welcome back to the Into the Wilderness podcast. It's great to have you on again. We are living in very weird times. Uh, so given that we haven't covered this at all, I've, in fact, I've deliberately not been mentioning it on the podcast to give people an escape. But what part of the country are you in and what's it like right now with the, the lockdown for the coronavirus pandemic? Well, hi there. Um, it's uh, Well, we live in very strange times, don't we? Um, for me personally, I think this is the longest I've been in one place for a very long time. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's it's very it's very odd. I'm I'm sort of holed up in uh, in Battersea in central London, and um, and yeah, I'm sort of gazing out across the uh, the train tracks right now. So it's uh, it's strange. But um, but you know, I, I think to be honest, from from my perspective, I've, I suppose I've been rushed off my feet traveling all around the world for such a long time that uh, for me personally, it's uh, it's quite novel to be um, to be you know forced almost to um, to stay put. So I'm trying to just make the most of it and. Um, get some writing done and um, try and, I suppose, um, find some positives in it by having a bit of a break, really. Um, just uh, we're, we're going to move on and talk about the, the main thrust of this conversation, which is going to take us to, to Africa and elephants. But as somebody who has spent quite a lot of time by yourself traveling, is there anything that you could say to people listening to the podcast who are finding themselves for the first time over a very long period with no face-to-face -face communication with other people? Yeah, I think, well, for me, from my perspective, yes, I've, I've obviously traveled a lot on my own. Um, but but even then, you know, I've, I've always been in a position where I've been able to interact with people. I've, you know, been, when, even if I'm camping uh, out in the middle of the desert, I've usually got like a local guide or people traveling with me. So, you know, for me too, this is quite an unusual experience. Um, I think the one thing I would say is, that um, you just have to try and stay positive, um, try and find some benefit in it, even if it's um, tough and, and it is tough. Um, I'm just trying to read books, um, catch up on old tasks, stuff that I've put off for a very long time and, um, and, and fill the day productively rather than, you know, just lounging around really. So um, I think, you know, if, if people are out there, they're really struggling, make the most of technology. Um, we've never been more connected than, you know, in the, in the past. So um, catch up with old friends. I, I've been just taking the chance to, um, to call up old traveling buddies um, in different parts of the world and uh, make sure they're okay. And, um, and hopefully, you know, keep those, keep those connections alive that way yeah and, and listening to the health official advice which some people haven't been doing yeah absolutely yeah stay in and um and keep your distance so the last time we had a conversation was at the discovery channel headquarters in london uh you had a new series out walking um where, where you were walking across arabia uh which was incredible 
You've got a new book which looks at the migration route of elephants in a location where I actually spent quite a bit of time last year. So I'm fascinated to hear what your uh, original thinking and uh, reason for picking this journey up as the the next sort of exploration that you were doing. Mm. Well, the the book's actually out um, on the 2nd of April, so that's next week. Um, And yeah, the series, uh, I think, is coming out sometime in May, although that's not been confirmed just yet so um yeah this this was for me was um a journey it's called the 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 tv documentary is called walking with elephants and the book is called the last giants um same same topic it's all about the african elephant um the book is a a whole pan africa approach it's looking at the, the well i've called it the last giants the rise and fall of the african elephant so it looks at everything from the evolutionary history um all the way through to um, the some of the early um, hunting and poaching activities throughout the 19th century, all the way through to modern day conservation policy. Um, so it's, it's a very broad brush look at um, basically what we've done as humans to this incredible species and what hopefully can be done to save them. Um, the, the the TV series is it looks at a specific walk that I did last summer in the summer of 2019, where I walked across Botswana following herds of migrating elephants towards the Okavango Delta, and I'm sure you'd agree it's a it's a remarkable place. Really, really it really beautiful. is. Yeah. So look, maybe we could just dig into that a little bit. I think it would be good for people to understand more the history of elephants on the continent of Africa, uh, what that population used to look like, and how we've got to where we are today. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so my research has, has taken me all across Africa, um, you know, all across East Africa when I did walking the Nile back in 2013. Um, I've spent a lot of time visiting elephant conservation projects. I'm an ambassador for a charity called the Tusk Trust. And um, and they've been very um, kind to, to let me visit places that they support. Um, last autumn, I was in uh, the Congo, looking at forest elephants. Um, so what I really wanted to try and do is get an understanding of what, what's happened to elephants. I mean, back in the uh, the turn of the 19th century, there were somewhere between 15 and 20 million elephants um, in Africa. Um, just 50 years ago, there was about 1.3 million elephants. So you can see a massive decline, mainly as a result of, of the ivory trade and poaching. Um, and then in, in the last, you know, in the last 50 years, a resurgence in, in poaching to, to fuel um, more the desire for ivory um, combined with massive habitat loss as a result of human population growth. So now there are only 415,000 elephants left. So massive decline. Um, and I've mentioned the two main causes there, you know, poaching on the one hand, which, which is fueled uh, mainly by ivory trade. Um, and uh, uh, now, perhaps even more worryingly, um, and, and perhaps the biggest threat to not just elephants, but, but basically all species, particularly the, 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 the megafauna, is the fact that more and more land is being converted into farmland, agricultural land, and, and ancient migration routes to watering holes, to rivers, to, to food, where you know, elephants need a, a massive amount of land to, to travel, to walk around, to migrate across in order to get what they need to survive. And of course, as, as villages grow, as towns grow, more roads are put in, it blocks the way that the elephants go. And so of course, there's going to be more and more human wildlife conflict, which usually doesn't end well for the, for the animals. I wanted to pull a few numbers related to land use change in Africa, just to emphasize the point that Levison was making. There are a lot of papers and research on the loss of habitat in Africa, and without question, growing populations continue to put a considerable stress on resources. In a paper for Applied Ecology in 2008, titled Monitoring 25 Years of Land Use Change Dynamics in Africa, researchers showed that An extrapolated model of sub-Saharan Africa suggested that there had been a 57% increase in agricultural area at the expense of natural vegetation. Natural habitat declined in the area by 21%. This equated to a loss of 5 million hectares per year over the 25-year span that they were looking at. A recent United Nations report suggested that food demand in West Africa is expected to increase by some 50% by the year 2030. 
Energy increase is expected to be about 45%, with water demand increasing by 30%. To meet this, more than 200 million hectares of additional cropland are needed. Consider also that an estimated 12 million hectares a year are also lost to desertification as a result of climate change. These migration corridors that have been broken up um, over years mean that it isn't a country-specific problem, which is very often how we look at wildlife conservation measures. That is something which I would guess was very obvious when you were actually following one of these migration routes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Botswana has rightly been held as a beacon of conservation. Um, Botswana has had um, a really, really good record of, of protecting elephants over the years. Um, and, and Botswana has the, the highest density of elephants. Um, there are some, somewhere in the region of 120,000 elephants, which basically equates to a third of all elephants in Africa. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is it, you know, it's got big wilderness areas. There's a lot of space for elephants there compared to other African nations. Um, and its neighbours, sadly, have a pretty bad record of, of poaching places like Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola. So elephants, you know, these are incredibly intelligent um, animals that, that if they're faced with threats, they'll go to safe places. And Botswana has traditionally been one of those safe places. But, but the problem with that, of course, is that as more elephants sort of congregate and stay in Botswana for safety, um, that basically creates a bit of a bottleneck so that there's more pressure on the resources in Botswana there's more farmers' fields getting, um, you know, getting trampled, and, and elephants are eating their crops, which of course creates this um, this idea among the locals in the rural areas that there are there are too many elephants, which is the irony, and sadly, um, that results in more poaching, more hunting, and uh, an overall decline in in the numbers there. So you're right; it's this is this is a, this has got to be a pan Africa approach, and one of my sort of takeaways from my research has been that if we want to save elephants. You know, you've really got to look at this in terms of, uh, you know, the whole continent, how national parks across borders can be linked up to enable elephants to migrate um, to where they need to go. Did you see evidence on the ground of the negative impact of elephants on the environment and to local communities when you were there? I, I know that when I was in Botswana in the Delta last year, the the density of elephants in that particular area, and, and it was the Maremi Reserve that I spent most of my time in. Uh, it was prior to any of the rain, which was concentrating the populations even more. Unscientifically, just visually, the impact that I could see on that number of elephants was very obvious, and it looked, it almost looked apocalyptic. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, elephants do, uh, I mean, they're called ecosystem engineers or, or forest gardeners for a reason. They do, um, you know, they do have um, a tendency, you know, especially in large numbers to to really make very visual um, changes to the habitat. They, they strip down trees, they, they um, break down fences, they, they, they eat a lot of food. Um, which can obviously have a, a negative impact, particularly on farming areas. Um, so, so yeah, I did see that. I saw lots of, uh, you know, part of what I wanted to do was I didn't want to make this an, just a pure natural history um, documentary. Um, I wanted to look at this as a, from a human-centric point of view. So finding out, you know, why locals saw them as the enemy, because in, in the, you know, 90% of cases they did, and, and how can that mindset perhaps be, be altered so that people see more value in, in the wildlife. And of course, a lot of that is is how sustainable tourism can be managed um, for locals to see a benefit from the elephants, whether that's through tourism dollars um, or at least having you know some guarantee that they're not going to lose out by living next to elephants. And, and so it's all about community buy-in. Education is is really um, is really important in in, in helping um, conservation because without that, without getting the local people's buy-in, the elephants don't stand a chance. So what is being done uh, in Botswana or across Africa as a whole with regard to meshing that community engagement and benefit from the resources? Because it's, uh, it's very difficult to understand what that trade is when you've got these very large animals coming through, destroying your whole year of crops potentially, and sometimes even killing people. There are a number, a number of people who lose their lives every year as these animal-wildlife conflicts increase. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, my guide, Kane, um, he was a sand bushman. This is a guy that, you know, coming from Africa's indigenous race of people, has lived his entire life in the bush um, and very much in tune with nature. Um, but even he said, look, you know, if you're, you know, you 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 white men coming over here telling us about elephants, um, basically, you know, if if you care about them so much, why don't you take them back to Europe and let them roam? <laughs> yeah, in Hyde Park, you know, and, and he's got a point. You know, we've got to really think about the, this inter these these this interplay between people and, and wildlife, and um, and I think you know, and, and to, unless people do see um, a tangible benefit, financial, um, then then they're not going to be incentivized to to save. The, the species um, very sadly so th- there are like you know thankfully a lot of very good organizations that are working to help farmers whether that's the basics like um, like installing electric fences or if they can't afford electric fences there are re- there's lots of low budget options um, elephants don't like bees believe it or not they, they're terrified of bees so if you put beehives around your fences when the elephants come, they scare off the elephants. So it's, it's a really basic thing. Um, equally, chili, they don't like chilies. So they, you know, if you can grow chili um, in amongst your hedgerows, um, when the elephants come, they'll try and eat it. And they, 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 they'll, they'll soon leave it alone. So there's lots of sort of things like that that are happening. Um, something called chili bombs. They basically um, grind up chili powder, put it into um, either elephant or cow dung when it's dry, and and basically, if if anyone sees an elephant coming, you light these things, and they set they give off a really sort of toxic smoke, which again scares the elephants away. So there are lots of things that people can do, but of course, you know, it, it's getting the word out, it's explaining to people why they should do that rather than just going and shooting or spearing an elephant, which can you know obviously provide meat, it can provide an income, and um, and so I think for me, the <clears throat> the biggest thing is to make sure that. Whenever there are conservation policies or tourism initiatives, lodges, whatever it might be, that enough money does trickle down to the local people so that they can see that there is a benefit to to living alongside wildlife. Yeah, it's it's so important that there is that local community buy-in. I wonder, with particular reference to Botswana and the Delta, where, as you've already said, they currently home the vast majority of the continent's uh, elephants, a lot of, or there are a number of conservationists who suggest that in that particular area, there are just simply too many elephants for the ecosystem to survive. And they need to be dispersed in a way, like you were talking about their their historic uh, migratory routes and other areas where they would have normally dispersed to are not necessarily accessible to them. A good example of that is uh, when they try it, I think rather unsuccessfully to get elephants to move out of Kruger Park because there was too many elephants in Kruger Park and they opened all the fences at the top uh, on the top side the elephants remembered the war in Mozambique and didn't want to go back there quite understandably through poaching and landmines and all of the conflict that was there so they they didn't want to go back to their historic range and there are similar issues uh, with the Botswana story with uh, the surrounding uh, countries which are not as safe as you pointed out right at right at the start so what do we do about what has been accepted as a very uh, detrimental impact to the ecosystem as a result of this high density of elephants, not just for the elephants themselves and the people, but all the other wildlife that also uses this this incredible landmass, which is the Okavango Delta. Yeah, well, you're right. The the density is, is an issue. Um, however, I mean, I met a guy called Mike Chase who runs an organisation called Elephants Without Borders, and one of his priorities over the last decade has been doing something called the Great Elephant Consensus, which has been an aerial survey um, all over Africa to try and count the numbers. And it's actually his figures that we you know we, we rely on. Um, as yeah, well it's as fascinating probably. that project. Absolutely, you know, and, and I was involved in that. I, you know, we, I helped to collar an elephant and put, install a GPS tracker. So, um, you know, I've seen what the, you know how, just how important it is to to do that because you can find out the exact elephant movements. His data shows that actually, whilst there is an enormous density in Botswana, the numbers actually haven't changed. So, over the last ten years, the hundred and twenty thousand mark has remained the same. It's just that the the numbers elsewhere have shrunk, so that there is a relative. Um, high density in Botswana. So it, it's a perception issue here. 
Um, there, there are. It's not that there are too many elephants. It's that people think there are too many elephants because their neighbours have less. It's that simple. So we need to look at this historically. We need to look at the macro level and understand that there, you know, there's simply, there are not too many elephants. There is plenty of space for the elephants that live there. It's about the fact that the, the, the human population in Botswana over the last 30 years has doubled. And of course, that, that basically means that there is ineb- inevitably more human-wildlife conflict because as the villages grow, um, they expand, they, they cut off these elephant corridors, and therefore, you know, there is more interaction. And inevitably, sadly, there is more conflict, which um, you know, can result in, in people dying, um, but inevitably results in a lot more elephants dying. So that's an issue of education. It's also an issue of um, alleviating poverty because if you alleviate poverty, um, you know, people then don't have as many children, you know, because historically people have had 10 children because perhaps five or six die in, in, more, in child mortality, infant mortality rates. Um, so th- there is, needs to be a real focus really on, on helping people um, in terms of medical care, in terms of um, poverty alleviation, particularly female education as well, so that people don't feel the need to have quite so many children, um, uh, which will in, in hopefully down the line in, in a generation or two generations time, have a bit of a plateau on, on this huge population curve all across Africa. Um, which will in turn hopefully help the elephants. But of course, it's it's the interim, it's the next 60 years. What can we do to make sure elephants don't become extinct in that time frame? Um, and I think that we're going to have to look at how elephants can move across these borders. You, you talk there about elephants not wanting to cross borders. I mean, elephants are incredibly intelligent, but highly social creatures. They can communicate um, between themselves and between different herds over vast distances. I mean, it's amazing what they can do. They can communicate potentially up to 20 kilometers away using um, a deep grumble uh, in their larynx that, that can be transmitted seism- seismically across the, um, uh, the ground. And they, they actually pick up these noises using sensors in their feet, um, which is an amazing thing. And I was in South Sudan a while back, and there's an amazing story there that um, during the South Sudan and the, the Sudan Civil War, elephants were either completely wiped out or they moved south into Uganda. Um, within 10 days of the civil of the ceasefire being called, the first elephant had moved back. Um, and and what, the way this works is that the, the young bulls, the young males, they go over, they kind of explore, they report back saying, okay, it's safe over there. And then the families come afterwards. So it's, it, it's a very complex situation. Um, and it, it's about, I suppose, guaranteeing safety for elephants, because when they understand that it's safe, they will cross back. But that, of course, takes some time. The uh, the Elephants Without Borders project, I know that one of the uh, recent reports that they'd had out was highlighting the amount of poaching that had been going on potentially without much acknowledgement from the government there. Was that, that a discussion you had with, with the team there? I know it was a little bit controversial at the time. There was, uh, I think there's actually a, a video on YouTube. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the same uh, gent that you were talking about where they were flying and marking all of these uh, poached elephants in, in different areas around uh, northern Botswana. Yeah, I mean, I, I flew over Botswana in a helicopter to sort of recce the route, and I saw um, elephants that had been poached um, myself, you know, and it's a, it's a tragic thing to see when you, you see an elephant with its face hacked off, I mean, it's not a pleasant sight at, at all. Um, you know, bot, uh, poaching does happen in Botswana. Luckily, it's not as prevalent as in, in the neighboring countries, especially Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, where poaching is absolutely rife. And a lot of it is down to corruption at the highest levels. You know, there's lots of governments complicit in this poaching and the trade in, in ivory, and that's very sad to see. And so that needs to be stamped out. That needs to be really brought home. Um, and and, and it, that happens across the continent. You know, in South Africa, um, a conservationist recently, uh, you know, well, a police chief actually who'd been at the forefront of fighting um rhino poaching himself he was murdered and you know and a lot of this is down to highly organized criminal gangs um multinational gangs you know money coming from you know some of the highest places um particularly in the middle east particularly in china um and uh you know even links to terrorism in, in somalia al-shabaab you know they get a lot of their funding from uh, from poaching um, from from the ivory trade even even al-qaeda and isis get some of their money in East Africa from, from this trade. So it's a, it's a highly lucrative business. Um, they say that it's either number three or four um, in terms of international criminal activity um, on, on a par with the illegal arms trade. So this is a massive, massive problem, something we need to look at. With 
such huge forces with a vested interest in keeping the flow of illegal ivory um, going around the world to fund such organizations, it kind of feels a little bit like a, a lost cause. How on earth do we even begin to tackle the illegal poaching across the continent for ivory when you have these very complicated, very uh, well-resourced criminal or terrorist organizations who quite simply do not care and have zero moral compass? It's a tough one. It's a really, really tough one because there are so many vested interests, like you say, that, that spans across the globe on this one. Um, I'm trying to keep some hope alive in that, you know, for all of the criminals, there are also lots of people that do want to save elephants and lots of amazing organizations that dedicate a lot of money and a lot of resources and a lot of time into this. Um, and and so hopefully that can prevail. Um, it is difficult sometimes to 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 keep hold of that hope um but i think that the answer lies in tourism and sustainable tourism because frankly if if we kill off all of the elephants and the rhinos and all the other megafauna then you know tourism in africa would would simply die so i would hope that tourism can outweigh um the poaching and uh, but that's only going to happen if everyone buys into it if everyone sees a benefit from it and it's sustainable so I think the focus needs to be on that more than anything else. Which is incredibly hard right now because nobody can travel around the world. I know I've been speaking to, to friends of mine in, in different locations around Africa and they are sweating heavily right now because almost all of the bookings that they'd had for the year have been cancelled and they don't know how they're going to fund the, the staff and the rangers and the anti-poaching units which require... It, whatever they're coming for, but people to travel from other parts of the world and bring foreign money into Africa. And that almost overnight has ceased. Yeah, no, it's it's an absolute tragedy. And, um, you know, I just hope that once this is all over, people will can go back out and, and continue to travel um, because it's really important. I, I, I'm a firm believer in the tourism industry as a, as a sustainable um, industry that, that can support local economies and can help people come out of poverty and, and we'll take the stress off things. But um, but you're right, it's it's going to be a really tough battle. And, and we've seen lots of, you know, articles and, and things on the internet about how, you know, the, the coronavirus, and the great level has enabled wildlife to flourish. And, and that's certainly the case in certain parts. But I think when it comes to looking at places like Africa, where you've got, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges for elephants is, is poaching, then, of course, without the resources, without the money being injected, that's only going to get worse. Yeah, I wonder whether the, the the current pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of places uh, like Africa with regard to conservation tied almost entirely to foreign money through tourism and whether there needs to be uh, more thought invested in working out how these conservation initiatives can continue without it or or using less of it so that there is not as much reliance when we do, oh, this is a very unusual circumstance, uh, but other things happen. We could have a, a, well, we're very likely to have a, a massive economic crash. We're, we're already seeing it around the world and who knows how long that's going to take to recover. So it won't even be the case that as soon as all of the travel restrictions are lifted, people are going to flow back into Africa because the money might simply not be there. And it just makes me wonder whether this is a whether this highlights the fragility of that system you're right i mean it totally does the um it's given everyone a, a real wake-up call um I, I think um it's 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 exposed a lot of the flaws in in the current system um and and yeah i think everybody needs to act a bit more responsibly um being a bit less reckless and um and hopefully um, people will focus on what really matters. And, and I'd like to think that enough people care about wildlife to to focus on this. Um, so hopefully that, if there is any positives to come out of this, it can be that when people emerge out of this this current crisis, um, they perhaps will will think about more about how they can support the world and, and, and local economies rather than just falling straight back into the rat race. Mm. Uh, it would be impossible to talk about elephants in Botswana uh, without mentioning uh, the country opening up 
hunting there the discussion for opening up hunting must have been happening probably about the time that you were there as far as i understand i don't think anything has actually happened because just as the that hunting season would have been opening up the whole world has collapsed because of coronavirus what was the discussion i'm curious to know what the discussion was like with local people on the ground with that was that was that something that you brought up with them and got their their opinions and feelings about uh, how the government were tackling that, whether they wanted it, whether they didn't want it, whether they saw benefit from it, uh, whether it was a good idea. Yeah, I have to say most people in Botswana really support um, hunting. Um, frankly, they they see um, they see a lot more benefit in in hunting concessions than they do in tourism. Currently, um, there's a lot more land set aside for hunting concessions than there are for national parks or tourism or um, nature reserves um, and that goes all across Africa um, and and local people can be involved in hunting I'm not you know I'm not a hunter I'm, I, I personally don't can't see why anyone would want to go and shoot an elephant I find the whole thing frankly um, you know unsavory but there's no there's no real um, argument when it comes to the the benefits really for um, for the local people they they, they see a financial incentive um a lot of the money does go back into conservation um actually the the numbers if you look at the numbers whilst you know nobody likes to see an elephant you know having just been shot um you know and posted all over facebook it's 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 unsightly but um but the point is that that's a tiny tiny fraction of um elephants when it comes down to it you know twenty thousand elephants die of natural causes every year for instance the same number that are poached now obviously um, you know, it's still a, a large number, but when it comes down to hunting, I think in Botswana, they issued something like 400, um, permits of which they only expect 170 or something to actually be taken up. So 170 elephants out of 120,000, if they were going to die anyway, whether it's old age or whatever, then th- the numbers are a fraction of a percent. So it doesn't have any impact on elephant numbers, um, in the grand scheme of things. Poaching has a lot more impact. Um, habitat loss and general land use has an even greater impact. Um, what's more, the hunting concessions um, in places like Botswana, Zimbabwe, they keep wilderness areas wild. You know, it, it doesn't. And if that was to be banned, um, then what would happen to those wilderness areas? Of course, it would be turned straight into farmland and then, you know, further decreasing the land which elephants have to roam. So until an alternative is in place, until something more sustainable has been implemented, I think it's it's a bit short-sighted to be banning hunting um, because, because it will have a very negative effect on wildlife, sadly. Uh, and that's the great irony of the whole hunting debate. Yeah, it's interesting one. The, the the moral question to it almost has to be put to one side when comparing it to the socioeconomic and the um, conservation benefits of it in this particular instance. You're right, the vast majority of people don't like the notion of anybody willingly want to kill an elephant but the benefits on the ground to people, and I, I would, this is why I was curious to ask you the question, because it's something that, that's brought up uh, very often is that uh, pro-hunting organizations like to talk about the benefits on the ground to local communities, but uh, is that really true? And uh, knowing how you travel in places and the, and the, the different uh, adventures that you've had over the years. I know that you really get to grips with the understanding of what's happening on the ground with with local people, rather than what you're told from organisations and governments and people who uh, maybe have an interest that is beyond the the grassroots daily survival. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I you know I'd like to see um, hunting not be a part of uh, how things you know work out there myself. But like I say, until there are, there's an alternative form of income for people um it could only be a bad thing i think because you know it's gonna it's gonna have a really negative effect on on land use and like i say elephants need lots of space to roam and if they don't have those wilderness areas even if a small fraction do get shot um then even more elephants are going to die and they're going to become extinct Mm. and i suppose it also provides um a very important protein intake for very rural communities well, it does. I mean, I think, you know, an elephant can feed a family for, for a couple of weeks, but I think that's, um, 
I don't think that's really necessarily part of the, uh, the, the the greater scheme of things. You know, people people can eat. You know, the, there's there's no shortage of food in somewhere like Botswana. There really isn't. It. A lot of it is simply down to corruption and um, and lack of infrastructure. You know, if you've got decent roads where food can be transported, then th- there's enough food to go around. There's people are not starving in Botswana. Um, certainly not um, not in the places that I visited. That it's it's a struggle uh, in in parts. Um, climate change is having a big impact on desertification and uh, and the changing rainy seasons are are you know all playing their part but with with better um, infrastructure with less corruption all of those problems could quite easily be resolved there is quite a lot of research available on the protein provision from commercial hunting activities in africa now different countries operate in different ways but an interesting and very pertinent example is highlighted in a paper titled Provision of game meat to rural communities as a benefit of sport hunting in Zambia. Yes, it's quite a mouthful. This was written on the back of the 2013 hunting moratorium uh, that took place in the country. Statistics pooled across all of the game management areas, which represent some of the most rural and porous communities, showed that some 130,000 kilograms of meat were provided as a result of of commercial hunting every single year, which equated to a value of more than $600,000. The authors noted, and I quote, although meat provisioned by sport hunting operators represents a small percentage of protein requirements for Zambians, it appears an effective means of distributing fresh, high-quality meat to some of the most remote areas of the country with the greatest protein needs, thereby partially alleviating protein deficiencies in rural Africans. In conclusion to the paper, it was then stated, the recent moratorium on sport hunting throughout much of Zambia created a crisis situation. Bush meat poaching is a serious problem in Zambia, and the severity and rate of poaching has escalated during the current hunting closure. Now this highlights a very important point. It's not just about food being removed, it's also about how is that food replaced And how is the extraction of bushmeat policed if there is no longer an incentive to protect the animals that people share the environment with? I'm I'm interested to know about your time in, uh, I think it was DRC where you were with uh, forest elephants. Did you actually have the opportunity to see any? Uh, Sadly not. (laughs) I tried my best. (laughs) I've been longing to see them for years. (laughs) I was hacking through the forest for days, but didn't see. saw plenty of tracks and plenty of um, of dung. But I mean, they're incredibly elusive creatures, and um, there is a. I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of research into this for my book. I mean, there are different species to um, to the African savanna elephant. Um, they're not, but they're not classed as one through CITES. Um, and the, there is an argument there that that people say that well, there's a reason because if um, if you classify them separate as a separate species, there'll be all sorts of issues about funding and resources and and how how their conservation is measured and things like that but um but, con- but elef- sorry um forest elephants you know there's there's somewhere only like 30,000 left uh, they used to be all across central africa the forest belt from congo to west africa um and now they're they're really isolated in these tiny pockets and and we don't know how many there are and nobody does because you can't do an aerial survey because they're in a forest and they're very very difficult to spot they're a bit smaller than um African elephant uh, than savannah elephants. They've got very different habitat and, and genetically they're they're slightly different too. So um, they they they're a fascinating um, creature. We don't know much about them at all. There's only a very there's a tiny handful of people in the whole of Africa that study them and, and know anything about them. Um, and the risk is, of course, that you know they will they will disappear before anyone knows anything about them. So the real tragedy. Um, I just hope that um, the you know, and, and the moment you know, as soon as the, the forests are chopped down, they they go because they they they've adapted to life in the forests. Um, so that's you know that whilst poaching is an issue for them, and they do get poached because they often inhabit places like DLC where security is an issue, and and therefore poaching is is rife and rampant and, and really un, unregulated. Um, but a but a greater threat is is people encroaching on their habitat. Yeah, they are uh, they are. A- a curious animal that I've I, I'm I'm desperate to lay my eyes on. I know people who have spent time in different parts of, of Central Africa and had the had the privilege of seeing them. Well, I'm, maybe one day yeah. I, the, the decline in the populations there has been yeah. scarier. It it's it coincides with countries that have 
suffered many, many decades of conflict between DRC, Rwanda and Uganda, that, uh, that those wars over the borders there, I think, were responsible for a lot of the decline in forest-dwelling elephants uh, over the sort of the last 50, 60 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I when I was in um, in DRC, I went to climb um, a volcano called um, Nino Gongo, and it's um, on the way up. I bumped into this guy um, who worked specifically in forest development. He was a vet, and he, you know, he travelled all around Cameroon um, and um, the Republic of Congo, trying to collar forest elephants. So, if you ever want to go, I can put you in touch with him, and he he'll take you on a mission to try and find some if you want. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing you need to make sure you sp- you have a lot of weeks aside. Well, yeah, he spends weeks at a time um, trying to find these these amazing creatures. As a matter of interest, just moving away from elephants for a second, but in, in the same part of the world, it, when you were um, traipsing around uh, in in the deepest darkest bush, there, did you ever see any uh, giant forest hogs or bonga? I didn't. No, no. Um, sadly, not. I went. I saw the. Um, I saw a few gorilla, a few of the the mountain gorillas, which was amazing. Um, but um, what oh, that the one, is incredible. The one animal I really want to see is an okapi. Oh yes, they're like a sort of they 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 kind of like half stripy um, zebra looking creatures, but with a sort of a snout of a nose, and it's it's an amazing um, animal. And they're they're really restricted in a really isolated um, part of central um, DRC. Yeah, they they they're an animal that they don't look like they should exist. It's almost like a kid sat down and drew an animal that was a mix of maybe three. Yeah, exactly. and and created this mythical creature. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're they're really odd to look at. Um, but it goes to show the huge diversity of of wildlife that used to be out there. And, and part of my the research from you know this book that I've been writing, The Last Giants, has been how elephants. Um, elephant species have evolved over the years and um it's amazing there used to be elephants out there there was there was dozens of different types of elephants some were just the size of dogs um one the smallest was the size of a large cat can you imagine an elephant the size of a large cat <laughs> had um four tusks you know some at the top some on the bottom jaw yeah um, loads of different weird and wonderful species that um that of course have all died out and, and, and the last great extinction you know coinciding with um humanities spread across the globe there were, there were elephants on every continent except australia and antarctica there were elephants all through north and south america um and of course as humans migrated um through these areas um they were they were basically the, the cause of the of the, this mass decline in different species but um but yeah so you know there we have it we're, we're we are sort of responsible for for the these enormous extinctions even though i spent a lot of time in africa and a lot of time around elephants until quite recently i didn't appreciate how many branches of evolution there were with elephants and i was recently at the natural history museum in los angeles and they have uh, they, they showed the whole tree up on a wall and yeah. they also have a lot of really fantastic displays uh, most people listening to this podcast probably don't even realize that there were many species of elephant in North and South America, just as you mentioned. And if you go to the LA uh, Natural History Museum, you will see them there. Yeah, they're there. I mean, if you ever go to the Explorers Club in New York as well, they've got an amazing skull of um, of um, of an ancient type of elephant that had four tusks. I mean, it's it's quite remarkable. Um, and uh, and yeah, there were, there were loads of just lots of different types living all over the world. Um, I mean, if you want to know a fun fact, um, obviously everyone's heard of the woolly mammoth. Um, they were all over Siberia, northern Russia, and, and actually there was a, an isolated pocket of woolly mammoths living on a little island called Wrangel Island in Siberia that um, only died out 5,000 years ago, which is bizarre to think that there were mammoths alive um, after the pyramids in Egypt were built. That is amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> bizarre, isn't it? It is. Uh, the, the other uh, distant, distant cousins which exist today are the hyrax and manatees. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, bizarrely, you know, there's little furry rodent-like creatures that you see scampering around Table Mountain in, uh, you know, in South Africa, or the the closest relative to to an African elephant. Yeah, it's it's, it's funny, and it, the only thing that really gives them away uh, is if you look at the bottom of their feet. 
and they've got like these little pads, like the bottom of an elephant's foot almost. Yeah, and they've if their teeth as well. They've got two uh, elongated incisors, which kind of resemble tusks if you look close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their skull is quite amazing. It's not what you expect. So if you see the skull of a dead one, mm. uh, you can see some similarities with especially the way the draw drop drops down on an elephant it's uh, yeah. it's amazing when you see those little glimmers of evolution you know going back hundreds of thousands of years well there used to be a um it was called the the cyprus dwarf elephant and um, elephants somehow made them made their way in, in way back in prehistory onto the island of cyprus and because there was no um there were no predators. They didn't need to grow so big and evolve into such big creatures. So they were tiny little things, um, you know, smaller than a, much smaller than a cow. Um, and, um, and, and if you ever look at an elephant's skull, there's a huge indentation right in the middle of the forehead. Um, so it looks like they've just got one eye. And that's where the, the, the ancient Greek mythology of the Cyclops came from, because when sailors landed on Cyprus, they found these skulls of what they thought were human giants, but that only had one eye. <laughs> that's brilliant. I didn't know that. There we but go. you're right. If you look, yeah, if you look at the skull. <laughs> the actual filming process uh, for this, this series that's coming out, did you have uh, any, any challenges on your way this is not going to be a wildlife documentary. This is looking at the interaction between wildlife and humans. Uh, lots of challenges. I, mean, I you know, walked about 650 um, kilometers through lots of different challenging terrains, through the, uh, through the Chobe National Park, all the way down through the Makadikadi salt pans, which is basically like this enormous desert, um, and then into the Okavango. So lots of close encounters with, with all different types of um, wildlife, as you'd expect and hope. Um, you know, some of them quite terrifying. You know, getting charged by an elephant is is uh, <laughs> it always gets the heart racing. Um, but I was in... How many of- times did that happen? Uh, it happened a couple of times. Um, you know, luckily to no ill effect. <laughs> but, um, you know, I very much felt that I was in safe hands with the, with with Carne, who's my Bushman guide, who, who just knew really what to do in every situation and, and knowing when, you know, how to stay um, downwind of an elephant to make sure they don't smell you, how to move through the bush silently. Um, even, I mean, there's one amazing, amazing sequence, which I don't want to give too much away. Sure. Um, but, um, but basically, uh, a pride of lions walked straight through our camp at night. So we kind of followed them to see what they were doing. And they, they, they killed a buffalo. And, um, and we watched this whole kill. But after the kill, Carne suggested that we just go and walk straight up to these lions. And because in, in the olden days, you know, that's how the Bushmen would get their meat. They would wait for the lions to do a kill and then they'd just go and help themselves to, uh, to a bit and then leave the rest of the lions. So there's this amazing symbiosis and, and sort of interplay between humans and nature. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. And, and wait till you see the shots because it's, it's something quite remarkable. Um, and, and I was, uh, I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly going to look for that. Where can people uh, watch it when it comes out? So it's coming out on Channel 4 um, sometime mid-May, I think. It's not been confirmed yet. Uh, but, um, yeah, m- middle of May on Channel 4. And the book is out um, next week on the 2nd of April. I was going to ask you if you're going to be doing any book signings, but uh, who knows, I guess, is the answer right now. Well, not right now, sadly. I, I had a whole sort of you know PR campaign planned, and uh, but all of that's gone out the window now. But um, I'm hoping that online sales are still alive and well. And I would implore... People, if they're interested in elephants, to to try and buy it online, um, and uh, maybe I can do some some signings from the comfort of my um, self isolation and, and get them posted. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you just uh, before we wrap this podcast up. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your journey in photography. I've noticed. I think just before this lockdown, you were doing uh, a, f- uh, a photography workshop in Nepal, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I was teaching a masterclass in in documentary photography out in Nepal. Um, photography has always been something that I've I've been fascinated in, and it's kind of been a hobby of mine over the last fifteen years or so. Um, I, something I took up in the army, and then I've taken it with me. You know, uh, certainly when I've been traveling, I thought, why not get some get some pictures? I've you know entirely self taught, and it's been a, it's been a great journey. Um, I'm at the point now actually compiling a photography book. Um, which is in its final stages of production now. And I think that's coming out in mid-September. Um, and that's a compilation of, of 15 years' work. So that's something I'm really excited about. 
Oh wow! Then there's there's going to be some amazing imagery in there. I, mean, I, I love watching you, uh, looking at your Instagram, and seeing throwbacks of things that you've 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 done in the past as well as well as current work. Where is there any way that you particularly get your inspiration for your framing of shots and and how you color your images? Mm. Well, I mean, I've got a few, I guess inspirations i'd say uh don mccullin you know is, is one of them for sure i was lucky enough to meet him last year and we had a good chat and i mean his photography which can, really does look upon some of the darker sides of human nature but but tells an amazing story um you know i think that's really something that i've aspired to and and you know i've been whether you call it lucky or not but i've been lucky to go to some some pretty dodgy places um around the world and and trying to find shine a little bit of a light on humanity in places that you don't expect it um and that's something i aspired to in in syria yemen iraq afghanistan um trying to find normal people and, and not focused always on the on the negative and the conflict but but looking at some of the lighter aspects of that. Um, Steve McCurry as well in terms of his- oh, Of course, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, I try and get my inspiration from everywhere, but but like I said, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a technical photographer. It's something that I've I've enjoyed and I've learned along the way and, and tried to sort of just just really um, frame. What I like to do is, is find a, uh, the subject, an individual or, or a group of people against their background, whatever defines them, whether that's their home, whether that's, the mountain range behind them um, and, and set them in place and, and tell a story. Cause for me, a, a photograph needs to be more than just a, a, a sort of postcard, perfect picture. It, it needs to really tell a story and, and be interesting. And, th- and that's what I try and show is, is, um, is that is the more fascinating aspects of humanity around the world. You're also a, a Leica ambassador. How did, how did that originally come about? Uh, about were you always shooting on Leica and then they saw what you were doing and contacted you or how, how did that happen? It was quite a funny story, actually. I um, I'd always, I'd always want, like, ever since I was a kid, I dreamed of owning a Leica. Um, but of course, don't all photographers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But of course, I couldn't afford one. <laughs> They're not cheap. Um, but basically, before I did my Nile journey, I'd been, I'd been shooting on other cameras. Um, and and then basically, I got, um, I, I managed to get, get, get an advance of my royalties up front before I went away and did the Nile. And I basically spent the, the whole lot on a Leica. Um, I think I approached them before and asked them if they'd sponsor me. And they said, Who are you? And told me to, <laughs> <laughs> told me to do it. Yeah. Um, so I was a bit annoyed with that, but I went and bought one anyway. And then, of course, came back from the Nile with about 10,000 images and then um, showed them what I'd done. And then they offered to sponsor me after that. <laughs> so oh. then I had two cameras because they gave me a camera. So I was very lucky. <laughs> what, what are you shooting on now? Um, well, I've got the I've got the new uh, Leica SL2, which is... Ah, um, okay which is uh you know it's got it's got all the modern trappings and it's it um, it's quite it's quite big but it, it's great for for long shots and um but i you know i still love the m series i still love that that you know this tiny you know old school proper looking camera yeah. uh you know nobody ever nicks it because they think it's something you sort of you know your, your, your sort of <laughs> granddad gave to you or something so uh <laughs> nobody has any idea of just the what it what it's worth you know <laughs> Do you ever do you ever shoot on film at all? No, I know I kind of miss that um, when it's straight to digital. Um, so no, it's not something I've really experienced. I, I, I missed it as well, but I've just started shooting film. Yeah, just Instead. just for something different, you know, yeah. just uh, something else, some another reason to pick up the camera. Yeah, maybe I'll give that a go. <laughs> uh, Levison, it's been fantastic to to speak to you today. Thanks so much for taking the time out. Um, I, I I realize, I, if anything, maybe maybe I've actually done you a favor. Maybe this is a break from uh, from sitting at home by yourself. But no, I pretty- uh, even still, <laughs> I, I I appreciate you finding the time and Thanks. telling us about your upcoming book and telling us about the upcoming series. It's a it's a really complicated story. And I think one that a lot of people don't fully understand the intricacies or indeed uh, appreciate the human impact. And I, I, I know from the conversation that we've just had, and it was in fact what I, what I expected from the other work that you've done, that this was going to be something that, that you focus on. And I think it's something that we, especially in the Western world, are quite guilty of when we look at wildlife conservation is to just look at it from the viewpoint of these animals and these ecosystems that we want to continue to be there for us, which I think everybody wants them to continue to be there, but we often don't consider 
those people that have always lived there and have to exist with those animals. So uh, I'm intrigued to see how this comes across uh, in the book and, and in your series based on the discussion that we've had today. Yeah, if you want to save elephants, you've got to engage with communities. It's that simple. Thanks for joining me for another trip into the wilderness. Join me in a week's time when we will be discussing on our new short show, The Implications of Mercury Toxicity in Our Oceans.